Welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. We're so happy today to have Leslie Fallian uh, in the computer science department at Harvard. Leslie is one of the best known computer scientists and winner of the Turing Prize and will talk to us today about holographic algorithms. Leslie. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'll... Um, now I see your screen. Oh, okay, good, good, good. Um, okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I'll uh, give a talk on holographic algorithms and do, if anyone's got questions, do interrupt uh, as we go along. Um, so I'll start by giving the context in which this uh, came about um, in, in, in uh, computer science and computational complexity. But um, at the center of it is something very sim sim mathematically very simple. Um, and I'll get to it uh, in the middle. So once um, I was the last speaker at the conference and all the previous speakers kept saying that, um, you know, they're just kind of mathematical speakers kept saying that their uh, subject was so simple that you could explain it with high school mathematics. So at the end, I thought, well, you know, for this thing, I could exp explain it to elementary school math with elementary school mathematics. So, <laughs> uh, but there's a small price. There's some notation involved. Okay, so there will be some notation. Uh, but uh, let's start. So this arose in the, in the context of um, oops. Oh, the problem stepping this on. Okay, okay. So this arose in the context of um, uh, computational complexity, where one uh, poses, uh, where one calls a function a, a problem. So uh, I'll give a very brief introduction, which uh, many of you uh, I'm sure will have seen. Um, so the idea is that uh, so a problem is something like you've got a graph, and um, um, and you define some sort of uh, structure in it. So matching is a subset of edges, um, which uh, such that no two edges in the matching uh, touch use a common vertex. So the underlying uh, dots and lines is a graph, and then the four heavy lines I've drawn is a matching in it. And uh, so this is a substructure, um, and so an NP problem is one where, um, given one of these substructures, uh, what you claim is a solution to the problem, you can easily verify whether it's a it's a solution. And so here it's kind of computationally uh, trivial because all you have to verify is that you've got a set of edges. You just have to verify that no two edges share share a vertex. Okay, so if I chose this edge, I I can't choose this edge. Okay, so it's NP means that it's uh, a purported solution is e easily verified. Okay, and uh, so there are lots of other, many other problems in combinatorics have this uh, idea that it may be hard to find a solution, but it's easy to check. So the Boolean satisfiability problem is, um, well, a special simple form of it is that you've got a conjunction and, and here you've got the and of three clauses, and each clause is, is an or of uh, three variables, and the variable may be negated. Um, so the um, plus means or, times means and, and uh, you want to know whether there's some way you can uh, substitute zeros and ones for the x's so that uh, this uh, whole thing is true. So in two set, you're allowed to have at most two um, uh, variables in a clause. In three set, you're allowed to have three. Okay, so, but it, all these cases are NP because if I claim that, you know, when I set uh, all the x's to ones, whether that's a solution, you can easily check that. Okay, so, so that's, these are the problems. And then once I give you an NP problem, you can ask various questions. Um, so one is, uh, does there exist a solution? Another one is, um, is there an odd or an even number of solutions? And then the harder one still, well, okay. The harder one than existence is the number of solutions. So how many, how many ways are there of having a matching uh, in this graph? So clearly the 
finding the number of solutions is always at least its hardest existence, because if you if you know the number, it's it can, you know whether it's a zero or more. Um, yeah, and if you know the number, you can certainly know whether it's an odd or even a number of solutions. And then uh, the connection between existence and parity that, that can get more complicated. So for uh, these particular problems, um, it turns out that, um, um, so here I coded, um, so I'll say a bit more about these. So certainly, uh, so red means easy. So red means that there is a polynomial time algorithm, an efficient algorithm, which can do what's claimed. Um, so for, um, for matchings, um, it's, it's red here. I can find whether a graph has a matching. I can also count the number of matchings modulo two, the parity of the number of matchings. Um, but the actually counting the number of matchings is uh, um, believed to be hard because it's sharply complete, which means it's the hardest of the class, it's as hard as any counting problem um, uh, where you're counting uh, NP solutions. Um, so this is uh, matchings, uh, whereas uh, the general satisfiability problem that's hard for all three cases. So even finding a solution is hard. The parity of the number of solutions is hard, and the number of solutions is hard. Okay, and the intermediate problems where um, two satisfiability finding number of solutions is easy, but whether it's even or odd, that's already hard. And uh, um, and counting the number of solutions is hard. Is hard. Okay, so we have the, these thousands of natural problems which arise, and we want to classify problems according to their difficulty. Um, and so just to give a diagram um, for the various models, so computability uh, defined by Turing, so that's the kind of biggest class, which is, well, the bigger classes still, which are less and less computable, but this means computable. So we concentrate on the class P, which are problems where you can find solutions um, in uh, polynomial time. Um, so one can define these uh, bigger classes. So NP is, is where you're searching for a, a solution. Uh, sharp P is where you're counting a number of solutions. And so, so here we're implying that the NP, you can easily verify whether a solution is, uh, um, is a solution, but you know, finding a solution um, is always no harder than counting the number, because as I said, if you know the number, you know whether it's uh, uh, zero or non-zero. Okay. Oops. Sorry. And then, so what goes on here is that, um, uh, so significant, uh, is that um, it turns out that these thousands of natural problems, they're not just independent of each other, they have lots of commonality. So it's a bit like physics discovering laws of physics and computer science, there's a, lot, there's a lot of commonality among the naturally occurring problems. And uh, here, so MP compete means that it's provably hardest members of the class. Um, so hardest in the sense that uh, if you could find a solution to anyone, then anyone, if you could find a solution to this NP complete problem, then from it directly by using using it as a subroutine, you could find solutions to um, um, every problem, every search problem, and similarly with sharp peak complete. So, um, so what happens is that there are many the natural problems you can usually classify um, into either being polynomial time, or if not, usually they're complete in some class, so you can explain why um, you know, your search for algorithm hasn't worked out. Okay, so this is, and you can find these in almost every uh, branch of mathematics, uh, the problems which are hard or easy. So um, if you write down an equation where the, the X and Ys are unknowns and the A's, B's and C's are constants, which you are part of a problem. So primality is whether you can factorize a number, is whether, is there a solution to this equation? 
uh, such and such, and uh, even slightly more complicated equations if you want integer solutions, that's already MP complete. So in these problems, the A and the B would be like large uh, integers of n bits. And the question is whether um, this equation can be solved. Um, and then uh, natural examples of, um, of Sharpie are like counting uh, matchings in graphs, which I'll come back to again in the permanent. Okay. And just to mention, so uh, the other classes one can put on. So BQP, that's the uh, uh, quantum computer, uh, uh, computation class, which is somewhat like here. So it uh, um, certainly includes uh, deterministic polynomial time. Um, but it's, uh, so of course, no, no one, no, the, all these classes could collapse. It's possible that everything you can do with quantum or with NP or with sharp P, you can also do in polynomial time deterministically, just that we haven't found the right algorithm. It's quite possible. Um, it's a reasonable uh, belief to hold that you, that you can do it, although most people believe that these things will go negative. Okay, so so um, subject to the fact that all these uh, classes could collapse, um, so computable won't collapse to P, but uh, otherwise all these classes could, could collapse to P. Um, but a current state of knowledge, um, you know, there are a few odd problems like integer factorization, which lie here, um, which aren't known to be complete in a class, but otherwise kind of, um, this, is the, this is the context. Um, and, okay, so now um, this is all formulated in fairly, in kind of Turing machines and discrete uh, complexity. So what I'm just going to discuss now is a bit more algebraic. And uh, so I'll just briefly mention that um, in some sense, all this development of complete problems um, could have happened in a purely algebraic setting um, outside of uh, computation. And so I'll try to reformulate everything I've said uh, briefly as algebra. So here, the um, instead of having programs written in uh, C or Turing machines, what we'll have is polynomials. Okay, polynomials with uh, coefficients from some field. Okay, and instead of measuring how many steps a, a computation takes, we'll just uh, measure the size of the of the formula. So here by formula, I literally mean something you can write down uh, in a, on a line. So you can add and multiply. But of course, as you make it, as you add more things to it, it'll get, um, uh, it'll get bigger and bigger. So it'll have a higher comp uh, complexity measure. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, okay. And, um, so in, uh, in this Turing machine complexity, uh, the, uh, you always need a notion of reduction. So when I say a problem is hardest in its class, what does that mean? It means that um, you're assuming a notion of, of reduction, which means that the notion that if you could do problem X uh, efficiently, they could also do problem Y efficiently. So if you had a subroutine for problem X, then a short efficient program, which calls that subroutine, would be able to solve problem Y. So we need a, a, a relationship between two different problems. And in the algebraic setting, that becomes very simple. So all one needs is substitution. So if you've got uh, your variables, there's X's here. So for the X's, I'll substitute some constants from the field, possibly. So an X form may go to three and uh, variables. Uh, some other variables for the x's. But for example, I could call you know, x1 and x4 both y1. So then I get a different polynomial, okay? And just uh, as an example, so, um, so we know what the determinant is, what that polynomial is. So the permanent uh, is, I'll get to again, but it's the same thing as the uh, determinant. 
accept that no, my, all the terms are, are positive. And uh, as we will see, so one big question is whether, um, so the permanent turns out to be uh, the hardest member of its class. The, ter the determinant is something which is easy. Um, and so the, um, okay, so, but the determinant is also complete in, its, uh, in the easy class. So what that boils down to is that you can compute the permanent, but the size of the det determinant you'll need will be exponential in the size of the permanent. Okay, so, and that's the case. So if, um, if I want to write, the, say, a, a 100 by 100 permanent, I want to compute that. And I want to compute it as a determinant, then the size of this will be something like uh, 2 to the 100 times 2 to the 100. So, uh, so even this is, um, I think this is the best known construction for three by three. Uh, so it's seven by seven, two, uh, so it's uh, uh, two to the three minus one, but now two to the three minus one. And, um, okay, so, and, okay, so this is the state of the art as far as the construction and this thing would grow, grow up exponentially. Okay, but all I'm saying at the moment is that in this algebraic setting, um, we have uh, two functions, um, determinant and permanent, they're polynomials. So in this world, they're polynomials. In the other world, we're doing Boolean functions. In the other world, we're showing that if one Boolean function, you could compute fast and you can use that to compute the other one fast. Um, here, or here it trivializes in the sense that um, if I could do a permanent, uh, if I can do determinant fast, which I can, then um, um, I can do the permanent by just a substitution. Okay, so you can imagine this as a, as a determinant with all y one y one one to y and n, and I've substituted x's for the for the y's. Okay, so it's a very simple framework, uh, this algebraic fr framework. Um, and uh, so just going back to the description, so as I said, uh, um, if you want to, we're reconstructing this world of complete problems in a purely algebraic setting. Um, a computation is just a formula. Um, a substitution is just a substitution. Um, and the analog of efficient computation is a small formula. So the size of the formula should be polynomial. I'm using the word in, in the second sense. Should be, poly, uh, should be some a fixed power of the number of variables. But now the question is, uh, what's this bigger, bigger class of polynomials? Um, so the point of NP is that it allows you to describe problems where the solution is easy to check, but somehow um, there are an exponential number of solutions. So it's like, uh, like uh, your there's some what's well, called non-determinism, but it's like some exponential search. Okay, but in the algebraic framework, it's just uh, uh, exponential summation. Okay, so um, so f will be a small formula, um, but then over some of its variables we're allowed to take this exponential sum. So we'll um, you know, put 0, 0, 0 for the y's and figure out what this uh, um, formula is with that substitution. Then we put in 0, 0, 0, 1, all zeros and 1. We put in all exponential number of different possibilities. So we get an exponential sum. Okay. Um, and so, uh, this now is something which, of course, from the definition, we, can, we cannot compute efficiently. It's, we define it to be exponential. Uh, but the question is, um, which of these happen to be polynomial time computable? And it so happens that many of the natural uh, uh, polynomials like the permanent, which we want to compute, uh, you can express in this form. Okay. Um, so, um, 
So I won't uh, go. Um, okay, well, um, well, okay, I have another slide on this. But what I'm trying to say is that as far as the setup, um, I've got no, I've got no mention of computation. To something very algebraic. I mean, Archimedes may have thought of this. Um, no reason why why he shouldn't have. Um, so these uh, this 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 phenomena of natural problems uh, congregating as in these completeness classes uh, you know, was discovered by computer scientists and it did appear in the computational context, but it didn't have to because it's got the, this exact analog in the algebraic setting. So the only thing which you could call computation is that we're actually measuring something like formula size. So if you call a formula a computational object, then okay, it is computer science, but it's um, it's only to that that extent. Um, okay, so just to uh, um, say another word about why this uh, um, exponential cost of computation in the algebraic setting is is somehow natural to us. Um, so the so the permanent is um, which is the hardest member of this algebraic class, as it is uh, the hardest member, a hardest member of the counting combinatorial class. Um, so as we know, it's uh, it's a sum of products. You've got a matrix of x's, and uh, it's the sum of all permutations, all the products of elements in the matrix from different rows and columns. So it's just the uh, exact the same determinant. But there's no uh, multiply of, of it's, it's not that half the permutations have negative signs. Okay, so that's the permanent. And so this is hardest member of the class. Um, if anything is hard in this world, in this realm, then um, um, this is, although there's no proof that it is. And some person may discover one day it's not. Um, but um, at the moment, we don't know how to compute it efficiently. Um, but uh, assuming this, um, very, I just want to show that some very familiar things follow, uh, in addition to things which are, which are less familiar. So let's uh, think of this other polynomial. So, um, so it's xij is this matrix of x's. And so what I'm doing here is I'll want to multiply everything in, in the jth column by y. Okay, um, and then what I'll do is I'll um, so so this is uh, right. So here I'm here I'm adding the rows and then multiplying over all the rows. But each row I've multiplied, I've labeled each element by uh, by the y of its column. Okay. So this is a simple polynomial. It's of size about n squared. I'm kind of adding up the rows of the matrix and multiplying these together and putting these y's in. But for example, if you take the uh, n-fold derivative um, of this polynomial with the y's, then you want to, to get something, you get something where each y, j occurs just once. So you'll pick out elements where you have um, only one element from each column. And you already only have one element from, from each row because you multiply the rows. So this operation of, of taking high derivatives gets you the permanent. So a very familiar calculus operation um, on a very simple determinant, or a very simple polynomial uh, gets you the um, something which we believe is hard to compute. So this is what's called the curse of dimensionality. Okay, you can get the integral out as well. Um, so it's so a very basic calculus, of course, in high dimensions, uh, does become uh, computationally hard as far as we know, and this is the reason. Okay, so um, that was all by way of introduction, um, just to say that um, um, complexity is full of, uh, algebraic things hiding away. Okay, so then this is this very, I'll do a very pedestrian introduction to holographic algorithms. Okay, uh, so the simplest um, question we'll ask is, um, when are two functions the same? 
So is an apple the same as an orange? Well, it, it doesn't look it, but maybe it is, okay? So we're here interested in, in algebraic functions, polynomials. Um, and so I give you two functions, f and g, are they, are they, they the same? Like, is the function x squared the same as the function x cubed? No. Okay, so where does this uh, conversation lead? Um, well, um, where, where we'll get to is that, in fact, this question can become um, interesting and, and useful because sometimes the definitions of, of these polynomials are, are complicated. And uh, it may be that they're two different ways of expressing the same thing. And then this will become useful. Okay. Um, so, um, and these polynomials will be like the permanent and the determinant. They'll have, uh, you know, many variables. Okay. So, so here is where, um, okay. okay. So, okay. So this will cast in the, in the terminology of counting. So we'll, this is where some terminology is introduced, but it's pretty harmless. But the terminology is not needed because it will be used kind of technically. So we'll go back to graphs and matchings. So K4 is a name for the complete graph on four vertices where every vertex is connected to every other vertex. And as we said, a perfect matching in this graph is what I've shown these two edges. Okay, so... Um, So, um, so what I uh, need to introduce a bit of notation, which is called uh, signatures. So for each of these myriads of combinatorial problems, I want some uh, kind of precise way of expressing the problem in, uh, in mathematical notation, not words. Okay. And the signature is this one notion I want to introduce, um, which, uh, so this is, uh, specialized to graphs of degree three. So here, every vertex has degree three. And uh, so the notion of, of a perfect matching has this signature. Um, so it means that, um, so these four positions mean whether I'm talking about having zero, one, two, or three incident edges. So in, a matching means that at every vertex, I've got exactly one instant edge uh, from my selected set of edges. Okay, so having exactly one incident edge chosen is good, and having any uh, any other number would be bad. Okay, so um, so this. Difficulty stopping this on. Uh, what's going on here? No, okay, okay. Um, okay, so the definition I want is that if I've got a signature, so here it is zero, one, 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 so zero, one, zero, zero. So this is four real or complex numbers, okay? I'm given a graph, here the complete graph. I'm given a signature and I want to count something, and I'm defining a sum of products expression. And, uh, um, and I'm summing over all the exponential number of possible edge sets I can pick. So in this graph, I've got six edges. So there'll be two to the six possible uh, edge sets. And I'll be summing over these 64 possibilities. And, and each thing I'm summing is that I'm assigning a number to each vertex, multiplying the four numbers together, and that's the contribution, okay? So the point here is that, um, so this is the perfect, this is the signature of a perfect matching problem, because whenever I take a set of edges um, where, um, no two edges, when every vertex is incident to just one edge, then every vertex will get this uh, weight one. 
And if every vertex get, gets weight one, then when I multiply together these four ones, I'll get one, and I'll get a contribution for the matching. So from any other set of edges, if I chose, if this edge was present as well, then I don't have a perfect matching. That's not a matching. And that's shown up here because, um, you know, if, if, I, if, uh, if there were two edges incident to this, then I get a two, uh, then I get two edges incident to this, I look up the signature and the rate is zero. Okay, so then I get zero contribution from that. Okay, so is, uh, is uh, everyone happy with that? Um, okay, so no, no, okay, so in answer to, answer to the chat, no, we, 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 we're just getting to, tra to holographic transformations. Um, okay, so. Uh, Okay, so um, for example, um, this set, if I, if this uh, set of edges, this is not a complete matching, but not a perfect matching, because these vertices have uh, zero edges coming into them. Zero edges mean zero weight. When I multiply together the, all the weights of the edges, or the vertices, I get zero. Okay, so, um, okay, so in fact, uh, the answer to this problem is three because this graph may have 64 possible edge sets, but only three of those are perfect matching. This one, if I choose the two vertical ones, and, and if, or if I choose the two cross ones, okay? So this is a generic notation for writing down a sum of products expressions, it's like partition functions, uh, many names for them, okay? Okay, um, so for example, I could, uh, in these um, signatures, I don't have to have just zeros and ones. I could have any numbers, like two. So if I have a two here, then of course, the contribution of each matching will be 16 times as much. So then I have 48. Okay, so this is, this is the notation. Um, and then, so what I said before, uh, as far as uh, uh, perfect matchings, um, Okay, so this is notation for um, perfect matchings. And as I said, uh, counting these is sharply complete. The parity of these is polynomial time and so is existence. Okay. And so, so studying a perfect match, by studying perfect matchings, you're studying in some sense all of, most of computation which anyone does in science or anywhere else. You know, it includes quantum computation. Everything is very, it's very powerful. Okay. Um, but for illustration, I want to do something else. I'll, uh, for the purpose of the next few minutes, I want to discuss this function. This is this is the not to function, which means that I'm counting set, sets of edges. Where um, so this set of edges will have a contribution if at every vertex, there's either zero or one or three edges in, uh, incident. So I've got the same complete graph on four vertices. Uh, this vertex has degree three, that's good. Others have degree one, that's good. Uh, but if I had any vertex of degree two, um, then, you know, then, I'd, then th that vertex would, would contribute zero. And in my count, I'm multiplying together the contributions of the vertices to get the contribution of the of this object. Okay, so is is is, uh, is my definition okay? So what I want to do now is that I hope, unless you've heard a similar talk, I hope you never heard of this function. Okay, not two. So perfect matching is a very important function. The not two function. You'll see what that is. Um, but I want to just show how you go about. So what we're trying to do in complexity theory is to be able to analyze any problem you give me, I want to know whether it's easy or hard. And this whole graphic algorithms method uh, gives you one approach to trying to do that uh, systematically. Okay, so, um, so the question is, I give you a graph, 
how many not two solutions does it have? Um, okay, so we're counting these are not twos, and uh, these are all good solutions because in every in each of these three solutions, um, there's never two edges incident to vertex. Okay, and of the 64 possible subsets of edges, uh, uh, 15 are good. Okay, so the answer in this case is 15. But the general question I want to ask is whether, um, okay, so this I, I laboriously count, did by counting up, uh, you know, one edge solutions, two edge solutions, zero edge solutions, okay. But it, is there an efficient algorithm for, com for computing this, or is this as hard as, uh, say, the permanent? Okay, um, so um, so again, so this um, I'm formulating. So once I, 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 I once I give you a, a, a signature, I'm basically telling you that zero, one, two, or three. So this statement will have to refer to graphs where every vertex has degree exactly three. So as we'll see, you also have problems where you introduce. You know, several signatures, a signature set where you can mix degrees. Here we have graphs where every graph has, uh, every vertex has degree three. So, are there interesting graphs of uh, degree exactly three? So, these are cubic, sometimes called cubic graphs. Well, there are lots of them. And so, these are two well known graphs. They all have 24. Sorry, they, they have. Uh, um, there's 24, uh, okay, they've got 60, so uh, the, these ones have six, 16 vertices and 24 um, edges, okay? And uh, so is it easier or hard to compute this? Okay, we want how many uh, subsets of edges, right? The two to 24 subsets of edges and a four million and of the sum number, uh, satisfy the not to condition. Okay, so is this easy or hard? Okay, okay, well, um, so I've got a theorem which uh, is proved by holographic uh, transformation. I'll get to in a second, um, but um, this is what it says. So, um, so for any regular degree three graph, well, this is all we're discussing today, so that's okay. Um, so, this is a problem we'll be discussing. Um, the number of solutions of this not to uh, um, problem. And this asserts that, um, as I advertised earlier, this will be an apples equals oranges uh, theorem, that this function, which we're trying to understand, is in fact equal to some other function. Okay. And so now this is a test of whether you can figure out what this notation means. Um, so this function says that, um, again, we're counting numbers of edges in, a, in the same graph. Sorry, numbers of sets of edges. Um, and uh, so if a vertex has degree zero in this subset, we'll, we'll give it a weight x. If it's got maximal degree three, we'll give it weight y. And otherwise, uh, any other solution will have weight zero. We won't count because it will break this definition. Okay. Um, if anyone wants to interrupt and tell me what this means, so now uh, this is something uh, simp simple. Um, so what subs what sets of edges does this uh, thing count? Any offers? Um, so regular degree three meant that every vertex in the original graph had exactly degree three. Is right. That right. Yes. So it, it seems that, uh, and in particular, your original graph was connected. Um, well, you can make a statement about connected graph. I didn't say it was connected, but okay, let's, let's make it connected, yes. Oh, I see. Okay, well then I guess connected components. So it seems like you're choosing connected components here. Um, connected components are allowable, um, but right. if you, yeah, that's so, it. So, so, so if it's connected, then 
this this what's the value of this? What what, what is this? Uh, I guess x plus y. You're summing over empty set in the full graph or something. Right, right, right. Exactly. So, um, so if you choose a subset of edges, and you disallow any vertex to have degree one or two, then either they all have degree uh, zero or they all have degree one, or all have degree three if it's connected. You're either choosing all the edges or none of the edges. Okay. So, um, okay. So, yeah. So, so, actually, so the weight would be x to the n uh, plus y to the n. Um, so, either all the edges, if you choose none of the edges, you'll give each vertex the weight x. So, the n vertices would be x to the n. So, and if you choose all the edges, it would be y to the n. Um, okay, is everyone happy with that? That this is a trivial kind of uh, problem in that, um, um, you know, if you choose a set of, if you have a connected graph, choose a set of edges, and uh, if you've got one edge and you're, you're not allowed to leave any vertices with uh, just one or two edges from it, then you have to fill up the whole graph. You have to connect everything up. Or maybe you haven't chosen anything. Okay, so this just happens to be a trivial uh, uh, signature. Okay, so uh, okay, so the uh, so if you believe that which you haven't which we approve, then um, sorry, um, okay, so x and y are the are some algebraic numbers, and if you believe that and you plug it in for a ten vertex graph, then uh, you'll get that. Um, the number of the answer to the right hand problem is just x to the 10 plus y to the 10 for these funny numbers, and this would be 625. Oh, whole number. Okay, that's the number of solutions. Okay. And uh, of course, we haven't used anything about the graph if you believe the theorem. And uh, for every 10 vertex graph, the answer would be 625. Okay. And if you want to go back to our previous pictures, um, so uh, if you believe the theorem, then um, the answer will be x to 16 plus y to the 16. So out of the, um, what did I say, 4 million odd subsets of 24 edges, there will be 29,375 um, solutions to this strange problem. But again, um, the answer does not depend on the problem as long as it's connected okay so this is a so this not to function which uh before one looked at it it could have been a, it could have been equivalent to the permanent so these things are either easy or hard often um but it turns out to be a trivial trivial function so the reason why you've never heard of this function uh, is okay it's a useless function okay but um when you try to understand all possible functions then um some will turn out to be trivial. Okay. But the question is, how, how do you prove this? Um, okay. And uh, so the answer is that it's, so, okay, so this is the essence of it. So, um, so the equivalence of these two functions, um, so these two functions are equivalent. So the fact that, okay, so the fact that this, this is easy to compute, okay, that you can see, um, this is hard to, Figure out what it's doing, but for now we're sure that they're the same. Um, and the sameness is is so this holographic reduction, which is uh, what I'll demonstrate, it's basically it's um, it's a linear relationship on the definition of the problem. So it's not some so inside the problem, it's a relationship on the definition, and this is why uh, we have to give up on using words, and we have to actually. Um, so I quantify the meaning of the words, the meaning of our uh, function. Okay, and so uh, formally, um, what what amounts to the proof is that um, you you show uh, certain linear relationships between these two functions. Okay, and uh, so maybe we should. Uh, uh, look at this uh, bottom thing here. 
So, um, so this one one zero one is really an, an abbreviation. This works for symmetric functions. So we're, we're looking at a, at a vertex of a degree three node. Oops. Okay, so we've got, we've got a degree three node and it's looking out and it's got three edges coming from it. And any of the eight combinations of the three edges may be chosen in, in your subset. So they've kind of eight possibilities. And uh, in this abbreviation, um, uh, this is the possibility that there are no edges. Okay, so now, now, now there are three ways in which you can choose one edge and uh, I've treated them the same. But when we go to the next step, we have, we have to separate these out. So this signature of length, uh, you know, dimension, dimension plus one really should, be, should become two to, the, two to the dimension. Okay, so, so uh, if you write down, so I've got these three edges, uh, going out of a vertex, um, and I can have all eight combinations, okay? And uh, so I have, I have to order these eight combinations in some lexicographic order. So this will mean zero, zero, zero. This will mean zero, zero, one. This means zero, one, zero. This means uh, zero, one, one. Okay, so, um, so the three cases in which I've got one edge coming out will be, this one, this one, and this one. This corresponds to all three edges being there. This with none of the edges. So this is still the not to condition. This is still the not to condition. So this is the uh, all or none condition. I have all the edges coming out or none of the edges coming out. And if uh, the Y comes out, then uh, if they all come out, I charge it Y, otherwise it's X. Okay. Okay, so this is... Uh, Okay, so I'll have a linear map which uh, maps uh, these two combinatorial um, conditions. Um, now, I also, um, so in this notation, uh, I also have to do something about the edges. Okay, so it will become clear in the next slide, but I also need a second linear algebraic condition. So, um, a linear transformation will be on, on like each edge in the graph. So I'm just looking for a two by two uh, um, linear transformation. And then I'll uh, tensor it, it up. So A squared will be this linear transformation and A cubed will be the same thing tensored up. The diagram will make it clearer, the picture will make it clearer. Um, and then it turns out that, um, um, you see the, so the problem is specified by these two vectors. Um, so I also have the edges which I've suppressed, which are, which are defined by those two vectors. And I need a linear transformation. I need to find a linear transformation which satisfies these two conditions. And if I do find this linear condition, the linear transformation, then I can assert that uh, these two functions are the same, although they look different. Okay. Um, so if you want, uh, okay, so, okay. Um, okay, so before I, I, okay, so, okay, so maybe, maybe, maybe I should, uh, okay, so maybe, maybe I should explain why, why that is, now I go back to another example. Um, so, um, Okay, no, no, sorry. No. Yeah. I'll do, I'll do uh, the other example first, because, okay, so, um, okay, so we did this. Okay, so I just want to give a couple of other examples of when you have equivalences of, uh, um, Problems which look look different, but uh, are the same functions. Um, okay, so uh, this goes back to more Boolean things. So as I mentioned, conjunctive normal form. Uh, so this looks like a Boolean formula. I want to know is is at least one of these three um, variables true? Um, okay, 
And, uh, and here I repeat the two formulae, the two clauses, and I can draw it as a graph. So each vertex is a clause, and for each vertex, I need at least one of the three variables to be true. So again, it's a rather trivial example. So independent set um, is, uh, is a graph theory problem. I choose um, a set of edges so that I never have two vertices which are connected. Okay, um, so here I'm choosing a vertices which, um, which mean that if, I, if this has got value one, it like radiates a value one in all directions, but now the edges become also um, objects which, on which I've got a signature, and this insists that the two edges can be, two ends can both be zero, one, or one can be zero, but not both one. So these are well-known problems, and you can count the numbers of solutions of this, and so this is this is a more complicated um, graph. Again, it's got degree three, three a degree um, three everywhere. And for these two problems, the number of solutions now is uh, is different. It's thirty one and seven, so they're not the same functions. But here it turns out that the parity of the functions uh, is the same because uh, for some functions to, you can find holographic transformations which preserve the um, parity, but not the number. Okay, so, um, so in this case, um, we're in, uh, in GF2, so the number of linear transformations is very constrained, not many linear transformations, but again, you can show that um, you can relate these two functions, which you want. Um, so this is the uh, all function. This is the uh, all the same function, and uh, okay. So the same thing happens here. Okay. So then the one diagram picture of why holographic algorithms, uh, why the holographic method works, it's uh, um, is uh, um, would go as follows. Um, so the way to look at it is that um, the um, although it's a bit hidden in the examples I gave, is that you can think of two kinds of vertices in, in this graph called generators and, and recognizers. So the generators will somehow shoot out particles. They'll be negative or positive particles. And the generator can shoot out maybe three negative ones or two negatives and the positive or... So, along, so these are eight ways you can shoot out particles along the three wires. And then these are the coefficients with which it does so. And this is what, I've, what I call the signature, okay? So here, here, here I'm treating the signature of the, of the um, perfect matchings, okay? And now the other vertices are recognizers, which um, have also got signatures in the same way, where um, for some combinations of signals coming in, I, each combination I, I've, I give some value. And again, I can, um, if I give it value one to exactly those where I've got one P coming in, I'm doing perfect matchings. So if I give you these generators and recognizers, then I've defined a matching for you. Uh, I've defined a problem for you, in this case, perfect matchings. Um, so this just defines a, a function, which you get by doing a sum of products. And uh, again, whether it's easy or hard, uh, I don't have to discuss. Um, but what do holographic algorithms come from? The, well, holographic transformations, where it comes from by imagining that on each wire, you've got a translator, okay? And this translator can um, map your signal um, according to this holographic uh, linear transformation, um, and then also map it back, and does the inverse. So this uh, translator maps the signal to its own little world, and then maps it back again. The translator does nothing. Um, so as far as the, what, what the whole thing is computing away, it's still computing the function, you haven't changed it. But if you look into the world of the translator, at that point, you've, you've got a different translation uh, of what the problem being solved is. 
So whereas you've uh, solved maybe a matching problem, uh, once you get inside these linear trans transformations, the, the problem is just a different, a different problem. Okay, so, so that's essentially what uh, these linear transformations are, okay? So that's an intuitive, intuitive explanation of <coughs> what these linear transformations do. Um, okay, so, um, so, okay, so what is all this good for? Um, well, these holographic transformations just give you another way in which you can move around between different uh, problem definitions. And um, it adds to the arsenal of other methods, which are mainly two other methods. So two other methods are so gadgets. So if you look at NP completeness proofs in the discrete world, uh, the only thing there you have is gadgets, very specialized constructions which somehow map bits of one problem to the other. In the algebraic setting or counting setting, you've got these holographic transformations I've mentioned, and also widely used uh, is polynomial interpolation, where um, the answer you're looking for is, is a coefficient of a polynomial, which you, which you, um, which you compute at many points. Okay, so um, I, I want to... Uh, just say one more, one more thing. Um, so what these methods have been applied for most successfully are dichotomy theorems. So these try to clear up more efficiently uh, the um, space of easy and hard problems. Um, so um, say for example, for NP completeness, so we've, I've drawn rectangles now. So NP is this big class, NP complete problems, problems complete in P. And if these classes are different, it's known that there are also problems which are in NP, but neither complete nor efficiently computable. Okay, so the structure of this, if it doesn't collapse, is, is uh, complicated. But um, what um, there has been progress on are these dichotomy theorems, which means that you define a subclass of problems. Um, and for this subclass, you prove that every member is either efficiently computable or it's complete in the class. So this is like uh, you know, doing some complete systematic classification of all problems in a class as either easy or hard. And for this purpose, you need uh, some specification of what all problems means. So something like a signature definition um, gives you the way of doing it. You can then use words to describe your computational problem. You can, uh, you can do it uh, more mathematically. And uh, okay, so there are, okay, so maybe just, um, um, okay, finish on, on one note where this touches on, on physics. Um, so, um, Okay, so, so constraint satisfaction problems are problems where you allow the, so this is the equality uh, gate. So you either insist on, on, on none of the edges being present or all the edges being present. And uh, so, the, uh, so the easing problem in physics formalized by, by this says that you've got, uh, say, particles, which either uh, on or off, and then you've got some bonds maybe between two particles where you weight uh, the bonds differently if they link particles of two different states. Okay, so this is the easing problem. Was, um, and uh, so um, the one classical sameness re reduction. So I, I said I, my talk is about the sameness um, theorems. And uh, there's one classical one in the literature, which is of the same nature, although the proof there is, is, isn't a holographic reduction, it's a kind of a ad hoc reduction, uh, but it's a very famous one. So uh, due to van der Waarden, which became influential in further work on, on the easing problem. Okay, so this is, this is the easing problem. Now we have graphs of any, any degree. 
And so he showed that um, uh, this function, again, using different notation, is the same as counting uh, subgraphs of even degree. So here you're choosing a set of edges and you're insisting that every vertex are the zero edges or two edges or four edges or six edges. And then whether you've chosen the edge or not, you weight differently according to how you want to weight your thing in the easing problem. Okay, so this is a, a classical result. Um, but one can formulate this as a holographic uh, reduction. Um, um, okay. Um, okay, so, um, so as far as these dichotomy theorems, um, so this easing problem is a special case, but you can ask um, for all constraint satisfaction problems, um, if you've got A, Bs, and Cs, what happens? And uh, so a uh, famous result by uh, a physicist is that um, you can count the number of perfect matchings in planar graphs. And from that, uh, using Van der Waarden's theorem, they show that you can also therefore do the easing problem for planar graphs. So, um, an interesting kind of generalization of that, uh, which is one of these uh, dichotomy theorems is showing that, um, is resolving this problem for all constraint satisfaction, constraint satisfaction problems. And the result is um, that uh, given any constraint satisfaction problem on plane the graphs, either is sharply complete, either is hard, or in fact, it's equivalent to this uh, fischer castellan uh, Templi result um, by some holographic uh, transformation. So either something is easy, either something is hard, most things are hard, and all the easy ones you can get from this one algorithm with some further translations by holographic reductions. Okay, so I think I've used up my time, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Um, Okay, there's a vast range of other dichotomy theorems proved more recently, um, which are very powerful. Um, uh, there's a book by uh, Tsai and Chen, which I'd recommend if you want to go deeply into, into dichotomy theorems. Um, but, okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Leslie, for a really beautiful talk. Perhaps now, you could stop sharing your screen and uh, people who'd like to participate in the discussion, I hope you'll turn on your video. Show it, hold it. Um, I guess I'll start with a big picture question. Uh, hi, Leslie. Um, hi, hi, hi. Um, so it seems to me that your point of view on when uh, two functions count as the same is firstly that it is absolutely a requirement that f of x is equal to g of x for all inputs x. But in addition, you want a kind of particular proof of that. And that's where the idea of holographic transformation comes in. You want a particular calculation that shows that reduction of f of x to g of x. Is that the right idea? Um, yes, yeah, so, so two functions are equal when they're equal. I, um, and this is one technique for showing it, uh, which works in certain circumstances, yes. I'm wondering, uh, so uh, it's, so were it not for the fact that this, you know, technique involved some sort of linearity and required, you know, maybe something particular about the codomain that it was something like, Z mod two or Z or something like that. Um, it seems to me that uh, um, this sort of relationship would be inherited by composites of functions. Um, I'm wondering if that's some, so. So what I what I mean to say is that if so, certainly if F and G are holographically transformable, and you want to precompose by some function H, um, then F of H 
should be holographically transformable to G of H. Um, the same relationship on the post composition side is a little less clear for me. I, I guess if you post compose by a linear map, that should be true. And maybe more generally, I'm not entirely sure, but um, is that something you've thought about? Um, yeah, well, yes, yeah, so, so it's not quite clear what this uh, pre-composition, post-composition uh, is in this setting when the kind of the variables are sitting on the edges. Um, um, yeah, so, so making sense of that would be interesting. Okay, so I don't know a good way of making sense of any of this, what you're saying, but any way of extending this would, would be of great interest. Um, well, I guess I'm thinking of a, a so uh, I've recently gotten interested in homotopy type theory. And um, so we were, think about similar problems in a kind of much more abstract <laughs> setting. So, um, so there, there's an axiom called uh, function extensionality. Um, which asserts that two functions are equal exactly when for each X in their domain, their values are equal. Um, so, so that's the axiom that's asserting the philosophy of equality between functions. Um, mm -hmm. But then you can also think about what uh, data is involved in a proof that for all X in the domain, F of X is equal to G of X. Um, in homotopy type theory, that data is called a homotopy because there's some analogy between homotopies between continuous functions between topological spaces. And a fact about homotopies between continuous functions and topological spaces is they can be whiskered. So they're sort of stable under pre and post composition by functions in this way. And in the sort of type theory setup, it's not so hard to prove that these homotopies can be whiskered equally. Um, I get that your setup is more particular than the one that I'm thinking about, but that's a structure that's present in this abstract context anyway. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, so, uh, so any way in which you could somehow uh, introduce composition in some interesting way would, would be interesting, but yeah, sure, my setting is, is, is more concrete somehow. But yeah, uh, I think the interesting directions uh, of trying to ex extend this, yeah. But I can't, you know, I, can't, I don't have a good response to your <laughs> question. Do you have results in the non planar theory? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so this doesn't uh, rely on, uh, yeah, so the holographic reduction by itself, because no, there's nothing about plan planarity. Um, and these, so these dichotomy results apply, which mostly are not mine, which, uh, yeah, so, so they apply, they apply both, they apply in a non planar case, in the general case, most generally sometimes in the planar case. Um, yeah, so there's no dependence on planarity. So the only reason planarity is mentioned here is because there's a remarkable algorithm which works for planar graphs due to, which I mentioned. Okay, so if you want to use holographic algorithms for efficient algorithms, um, basically, this is a reduction method. You have to start with some good algorithm. And so the planar case is obviously an interesting case. Um, in the general case, the danger is that many problems or everything will turn out to be hard. So you, if everything turns out to be hard, that's again, that's interesting. But there are some cases in the general case uh, which are efficiently computable. So do other people have questions or comments? I mean, I have, an, I have another question. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> Why don't you go ahead? Sure. Uh, I mean, it's, so I didn't entirely understand the full definition of a holographic reduction. I mean, there was some, there were a bunch of linear equations that needed to be satisfied. Yeah. Is that something I could look up somewhere or could you say a bit more about it? Um, yeah, you, you, you should, you should uh, um, probably look, look up somewhere. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's just, uh, um, um, yes, yeah, so, so it's just a requirement on, on mapping. You've got two, two problems with uh, specified by, you've got two problems with each specified by a bunch of, of signatures, not necessarily by one you can use. Uh, and uh, it's a set of linear, linear relationships you need to um, establish between the, the two sets of signatures. To, which is sufficient to guarantee that they compute the same function. Um, 
um, and uh, and their purpose is kind of to make to work out what I try to show with these linear translators. Okay, <laughs> that's what that's what they achieve. Um, but I think probably even if you look at, look on the web, maybe you can find these definitions. Yeah. I mean, is there a paper if, in particular? I tried Googling and I got a lot of very weird results that I think are unrelated. Okay, okay. okay. Um, well, if you if you want to, um, well, you can look up my, my paper from two thousand and eight uh, called Holographic Algorithms, um, and this book I mentioned by by Tsai, this CAI and Chen, uh, the title is something like uh, Dichotomy Theorems. 2017, Cambridge University Press. That's a heavy duty book on, on, on these things and some other things. Okay, but. Um... Well, thank you very much, Leslie. This was a very interesting talk and hopefully um, we'll look forward to some further results in this area. Okay, well, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay, bye, bye, bye.